little intro. Hello, this is Francis McCaffrey from McCaffrey Crafts. You you recognize my ugly mug from all these videos and stuff. But uh, today I have a special guest on and someone that I think would be very good to introduce to the Black Torn and Shillelagh community. Um, here I have on camera uh, a guy that I used to know as Mark, but now he's going by the name Marcus. Um, he uh, has set up with, uh, with his partner, I think, um, this um, Irish mythology podcast. And uh, it's something that I was very uh, keen to, to kind of promote and uh, keen to get Mark on to, to talk about it. Because, um, you know, there's many guys out there, armchair kind of historians and stuff, but Mark is the real deal. Um, he has put a lot of time and study into Irish mythology, Irish history. Um, this guy, Mark, has so much knowledge. He's an avid reader as well. He's someone I, I, I really highly regard um, his opinion. Um, we know each other from from the college years as well. Um, and me and Mark uh, have, have had many debates over the years. Um, Mark has a very strong interest in politics and world affairs as well. Um, he's one of the, the greatest guys you could ever sit in a bar and talk to as well. Um, and I'm going I'm going to encourage him to get a YouTube channel now in a minute. But anyway, um, that, that's like a little kind of, uh, you know, intro to Mark. So, uh, Mark, how's it going? Or Marcus? Great. Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah, good, good. So, what, what do you like to be called nowadays? Is it Mark or Marcus? Oh, either is fine. Marcus Grant. Um, I use Marcus, the Irish form for anything I write, and you know, just to have a kind of slightly different persona, you know, to the okay. to the everyday. It's all right. So, so to start, whatever you know. Okay, so to start, Marcus, tell me what is the Irish Mythology Podcast? What it was about? Well, I think. It's about Irish mythology, like, um, I suppose we call it that because, you know, when people are searching for different kind of topics online, it can be difficult because people give, or initially I was going to call it something, you know, that was a bit clever, but it's, it's literally about Irish mythology. And what we do, I suppose, is we look at the myths and the myths about the myths and their origins. And we come at it from a lot of different angles from like, so when you have say a famous saga like the wound of Attain, which you know, some people might be familiar with um there's you have all these different layers it's a bit like archaeology you have all these different layers of context built up because at some time in the distant past that was a poem that was only passed down orally um from generation of uh, filler to generation you know the the old poet the poets of old and then of course christianity came and writing became a thing but it was the writing of the early christians was heavily influenced by christianity itself and eventually by you know the classical greek and roman kind of writers so when you have those sagas you can peel back those layers and you can see well this bit is obviously influenced like taking a saga like the second battle of Maitura you can see precisely where the influence of Viking raids and things like the battle of Clontarf are and you can you can pinpoint the historical moment when those things were added you know and if you peel them back you you might get a glimpse of Mm -hmm. what those stories were before Christianity but you you only get a tiny bit of it so it's very hard to to get a grasp on it. I'm very interested in what I suppose the beliefs um, and the ways of life of our ancestors were, you know, so we'd look at the archaeology, the archaeological evidence, the linguistic evidence and all of these things when we're putting together a podcast. And, and at the end of the day, it's about telling a story, but it's about telling a story in a way that we kind of update it, but we tell you where we've updated it and then we show you where other people have updated it all throughout history. Right. I think that's very important to do. And you, you touched on something there that I think is important for people to know in terms of the research you put into this, that it is very difficult. And you said something there that I found interesting about um, it was through word of mouth and through poems and through songs and through different things that that information has come down, because as you well know, a lot of things weren't really documented. So with that in mind how do you draw the line between what is mythology and what is actually historical fact like and um, when you're researching it well i suppose the only thing you can 
claim as historical fact to stuff you've got like multiple written sources for the there's some sort of corresponding archaeological evidence and there's not a lot of stuff the further you go back the mistier it gets you know i mean you have lists of kings in irish what we call pseudo history now that's kind of part myth and part history and um, you had all these kings that would have been descent from a fella called Nile, Nile of the Nine Hostages. And that was kind of gave you some sort of political legitimacy to rule. Um, and I suppose Ireland was like culturally divided way back when into the northern half and the southern half. And the, the northern half was, I suppose, all the way down to the Liffey and across a bit. And probably took yeah. in most of it. And then the southern half was Munster, Ossery, all of that, you know. And when you go back to the Iron Age, you know, people love this vision of the Iron Age as being this time of warriors and whatever, but it was actually a time of decline in things that we would consider to be hallmarks of civilization especially in the northern part. In southern Munster, you still had the settlements, um, agriculture and things that were left over from the Bronze Age, which was a time, the Bronze Age was kind of a golden era of you know, agriculture and settlement and things like that. In most of the northern half of the country, and I suppose even the northern half of the southern half, um, there was a return to pastoral uh, nomadic lifestyles. People would travel around. This is what the archaeological evidence is telling us. Then, you know, some sometimes they might find something different, but um, people would basically travel around the country with their herds. And the echo of that that's left in mythology is called Dinshankis, the the lore of places. Their their poems that tell you, you know, highly mythologized version of how places came to be or how they got their name. Um, but there's a fella called, I don't know if you've heard of um, Mankan Magan. He's Magan, um, no, no, it sounds, it's a pretty yeah, good yeah. name though. Yeah, very interesting fella. He, he, he's he's actually from Dublin originally, but his grandmother was from the Kerry Gale Tuct, and he used to go down there all the time. That's where he learned his Irish. But he has a book called is it 32 names for 32 words for field or something like that? And it's all about how when you look at the language, it'll tell you something about the culture. And he he, he compares the, the metrical Dinshankis poems to you know Aboriginal song lines, and that if you recite them in the correct order, it'll basically give you directions which way to go around when you're doing this pastoral nomadism. Um so you're saying you're saying that the Irish are essentially nomads that this would be ingrained in Irish culture from, from ancient times and that uh, there's no distinction. So this rivalry between Kerry and Dublin and Kerry and Cork is all nonsense and bollocks because we're, we're, we've all moved around. We're, we're all one, one Irish because uh, yeah. what, what people don't know is that within Ireland, there's a rivalry between certain areas of Ireland, whether it be sports rivalry or cultural as well, especially between where I'm from, Kerry, and Mark's part of the world, which be uh, the, the kind of Dublin area as well. Yeah, of course, I'm a Mead man originally, and that would bring its own rivalries. But we would traditionally have Navin, rivalries. Navin, isn't it? Yeah, Navin is a, yeah, yeah. Is, is a but, Navin. Man. But also, we have this very strange rivalry with Cavan, which which I which I actually love because it's not mainly a sporting rivalry. Because well, it, it does carry over into sport on the rare occasions when Mead would meet Cavan in, in sports. But you know yourself, like the way the championships the Gaelic football and hurling are arranged here that Mead and Cavan wouldn't meet all that often because they're in different provinces yes. um, and I think it got, probably goes back to at least the early early medieval times when there would have been a rivalry between the kingdoms of Mead um, and Breffney which was where Cavan was you know um, there's a great story about when Cavan were in a, last in the all Ireland final, I think it might have been 1961 or something like that. Or um, I think Meath and Cavan had played the year before when that final that was played in New York. And the following year, Cavan were playing 
Kerry or Cork or somebody in the final. And they were traveling to Croke Park. And at the time, you would have had to go through the town of Navan. There was no bypasses or motorways or anything like that. And people in Navan built bonfires and burned effigies of Cavan players on the bonfires as the <laughs> Cavan people were traveling through the town. It's a mad, it's, mad, mad horrors. It is, yeah. It's, yeah. But it's really fascinating stuff like that and how those rivalries develop over, over the... Okay. Here's a question. Life. Here's a question I'm interested in. I don't know if you'd be able to answer it. Like, um, within Ireland, there are so many dialects and accents, and a lot of people find that interesting because if you come to Kerry, you can go to Tralee, which is 17 miles away, and they have a distinct accent. Then you can go eight miles into Glencar, and they have a distinct accent. Then you can go 20 miles. And it's something that I've always been kind of fascinated with in terms of that there are so many different accents within such a small country. And, you know, a lot of Americans are very interested in this as well. They, they find out, like, what you have so many accents because they have their Midwest accent, their New York accent, their Brooklyn yeah. accents. But um, is what is there any kind of correlation in your kind of research to to that? Or, you know, it'd be interesting to get your, your take on that. Yeah, to, to, to an extent, I suppose, because, um, you know, I was never very good at Irish at school, but as an adult, I've kind of got back into it. That's how it's taught. And, Irish is taught very yeah. boringly. Well, we'll I, I think that's kind of too easy, though. I think it's not just the, I think to an extent, the curriculums, but I think when you're learning any other language, there's a wealth of other material. You know, if you're learning French, you can, there's loads of French films, you know, if you're trying to become proficient in it. But you don't so, teach kids grammar like the Tish Benedict. Um, when, when my generation growing up, which might be yours, is that um, you are ingrained in learning grammar and reciting things. And if you put that to, say, German or French, when they sometimes they take a lexical approach where they're teaching around situations and they're giving you vocab around situations, I think that's a better approach to teaching a language. But Irish is um, it's just one of those subjects that is taught in a very kind of hardline religious type of way and uh, i yeah. feel that it, it it really puts kids off like even my three kids now they hate irish they yeah. don't want to study it it's it's it hasn't changed mark they're still teaching yeah. it in this very uniformed constructive way you know here's the grammar learn the vocab and uh, it's not fun like when they do french or spanish or something like my son loves he's doing some spanish and he thinks that that's quite interesting but mm. um there's a big big difference in how Ireland is, is treated as this kind of like structured, literary, grammar based as opposed to like a fun, verbal, spoken language. But, um, but anyway, we yeah, can yeah, talk for hours about good. the education system in Ireland. <laughs> you need a balance. And I, I suppose I, I don't know an awful lot about, you know, how it's taught now because, you know, I don't. Um, the same, but exact same mark, we, I can tell you. Is it? We went, we would go to, myself and Steph would go to, the Gael talked in Donegal, you know, and the way it is taught there is more of that kind of, you know, situational thing. And the great thing about when you, if you go to the Gael talked, and I would recommend it highly to anybody watching, you know, you get loads of, you, there's a lot of Americans that come over because, you know, they want to learn the language. And just explain Irish. what the, uh, the Gael talked area is for, for someone watching. So, the oh yeah, the Gael talked area is, there are these areas of the country that were designated Irish speaking where you had um I suppose a large number of native Irish speakers. And the number of actual native Irish speakers in different Gaelic varies, you know, so some of them are quite high in parts of Donegal. I'm not sure what the Kerry situation is like. Um you have um it was because in during the course of the English occupation of the country um, at times Irish was it was illegal to speak Irish at times it wasn't but there was this thing where parents would want their children to speak English because you they perceived it as being a way to move up in the world very much in the same way as I suppose our parents would have wanted us to speak properly you know when you're growing up and I've kind of come full circle on that as well because you know, after going to college and studying people like James Joyce, and you're going, well, they're using the colloquial, the you know what, what I call her, her, Hiberno English, and ways of speaking that is influenced from the Irish language and how we construct sentences. You know, and even in it has its own unique kind of grammar, and has you know the way the Irish speak English. There's tenses that you don't use in 
everyday English. But the Irish language was basically dying out. And so when after the independence of the 26 counties, the government decided to create these designated um, Irish speaking areas. Now, the wisdom of that is hotly debated, but sure. Um, because it kind of ghettoized the language. But the thing about these places is a lot of them have these, you know, summer colleges where you can go and some some of them are places where school kids go and then there's ones for adults and we go up to uh, Donegal to Idja Scale. And going back to your question about dialects and stuff, speaking Ulster Irish, because in, in schools you mainly learn kind of, it's kind of a blend, Munster and a bit of Connacht is the, the Kaidan Afagil. So you have the, in terms of dialects, you have the Ulster dialect, but within the Ulster dialect, there's sub dialects. And Munster, I presume, similar. Um, and Connacht are the three main dialects. The Leinster dialect died out in the 19th century. Um, and then you have what's called the Kaidan Afagil, which is the official dialect of the state. So when you get official state documents that are produced in Irish, they are in this kind of made up dialect because it which is kind of a blend of Connacht and Munster and Ulster is kind of left out. But when I started as an adult relearning Irish and doing it in Ulster Irish, I found it found it much easier. Because and I think it's because that in the part of the country where I live, you know, North Meath, Loud were if you go considered more part of Ulster than they were part of Leinster until after the Norman conquest and the dialects spoken there right up until you know the early 20th century in the small pockets where there were still were a variation on the Ulster dialect and like the, what you'd see the biggest difference I think is probably between Munster and uh, Ulster and Connacht is somewhere in between um, where you would have you know, when you have those like words with where BH is a V in in oh, Munster, yeah, Munster yeah, Irish. Yeah. In, in Ulster Irish, you just forget them, you don't pronounce them. And, and you know, the in Munster Irish, which is, and this is the way most people would say the word for woman or women is Mana. Oh, yeah. Which is the Munster Irish. In Ulster Irish, you pronounce that N as an R, so it's Mara. Yeah. And that made all the difference to me because I just find that very hard to get my mouth around those kind of more monstery um yeah. things. And well, we, we can't understand people from the north way they speak anyway. <laughs> well, I know, I know it's, it's funny because, because I am um, give you an example of a sentence. Um if you're going into a cafe and you wanted to order two bowls of hot soup in Munster, you'd say, uh, ga, ga, anre, he. In, if you're in Donegal, you'd say, hi, yeah. And that's it. Like, what? <laughs> hi, yeah. And they'd understand yeah. you, like, you know, that's. Yeah, I remember we have to learn a Donegal Irish when we were at school a little bit on the oral test, there was like five minutes of it. And all I can remember is the difference between shopkeeper, which in Munster Irish is shopador, but in Donegal, shopador, 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 yeah, shopador, yeah. shopador. And it's yeah. just, I, yeah. I just felt that kind of chirping type. And then you can yeah. Yeah. understand then how the English Donegal accent is because it's quite similar to how the Irish is spoken with this kind of, I don't know, it's kind of like um it's a mid tone but very fast and a lot of the words just blend into each other really quickly. So um yeah. I think yeah. uh, but what what would you say is the hardest accent for say a North American to understand in Ireland? I don't know. Well I suppose you know I know if you a few friends from North America now, and if I'd thought of it before, I would have asked them. But uh, I don't know. You know, Cork is pretty heavy. If actually the city of Cork, do you know if you go uh, places That's like? Um, Are you a yeah, was, man? <laughs> I, Like I've had difficulty understanding them. You know, going into order a bag of chips, and 
yeah Demasi it's just the slang in cork yeah there's loads of slang i think i mentioned it loads of times on the channel i always yeah, yeah. use the cork slang word langer but i've never explained it for youtube reasons of course but um <laughs> you know, we won't now mark we won't mark but, <laughs> because i've been called a langer many times by by many yeah. people but um well, that's cork, you know, like when i when I, i've been called a jackeen in um cork and i'm not even from dublin you know a jackeen is a yeah. cork slur for a dub you know there's loads of there's loads of there's loads of slurs for dubs. Uh, Dublin, outside of Dublin, Dublin would probably be the the county in Ireland that's most kind of I, I don't know is despised or I, like it is, I'm using a strong word because I do get that sentiment from from a lot of people that um, Dublin would be like the county that that uh, you know most people outside of uh, Dublin always kind of um, you know just don't don't like too much. Um, so I, I always find it interesting that such a small country that all of these little rivalries exist and. I always thought there were some historical reasons for that, of course, because of politics, because of boundaries, um, because of tribes, because of, of, of different things. But I, I found it interesting to start when you're saying we're all yeah. nomads moving around or, or sheep and our cattle from, from place to place. Yeah. yeah, I think it was around the time of probably around the, the second century. And the, the reason this is kind of believed to be the case is because they study things like the pollen record and they could tell when alcohol, when when agriculture declined and rose and they can see in archaeology like what people were eating and during the kind of iron age early, like early to mid iron age they were eating mainly nuts and meat and not a lot of grain there were still kind of pockets of south munster where they had more grain it was, there was more agriculture there so they were, they were on the keto diet back then, yeah? Pretty much, yeah. Um, they were keto diets and intermittent was, fasting. Yeah, they were con constantly in ketosis. Um, yeah. No wonder there's so much energy for all those cattle raids. But uh, they would then around, I suppose, the second century AD, you see a rise in agriculture again. And there's interesting things in mythology linked to that time, like the god Lu becomes really popular and starts to appear in place names and you still have you know in irish the month of lunacy named after yeah, yeah, yeah. august is named um, and the festival of lunacy yeah um its popularity seems to like rise around the time agriculture starts to rise and it's a village up the road from us here so i'm in drada county Loud, which is on the mead and Loud border and speaking of local rivalries like do you know if you mentioned dundalk in this town people go jeez dundalk get everything there's a there's a perception that the council and and there, to an extent it's it's legitimate that the Dundalk gets more council funding because the council is up there you know but also there's this long running rivalry between Drada and Dundalk and you know you, you were talking about accents and dialects the the accent in Drada is vastly different to the accent in Dundalk you know it's actually kind of different to anywhere but um. An interesting fact for, for people from the states might um, be interested in is that Drada is, I think, the last place in Ireland that has a non-rhotic accent. Um, it's kind of dying out in the younger generation, which I think is a sad thing. So it'd be similar to Boston in that people don't pronounce that R after a vowel. So. Um, people like pure draw the people that I know would call me Mac, you know, just know that R is dropped. And even you can see it in the, in the name, in the way people from Drada, which, so it's D-R-O-G-H-E-D-A, which you'll see in television programs from abroad, people calling it Dragada, um, the, the, the official Irish pronunciation is Drogheda, but people from here say Drada, um, which again is linked to how you would have said it in the Ulster dialect of Irish. You would have dropped the the a father, so there's an accent on the a, you know, which is I suppose if you speak French, it's like the aigu accent. So um, would you would you say then that the Saudi Boston accent could be strongly influenced more by Northern Irish? type of um immigrants that went there more so because of the there's a lot of similarities between some of the sounds from draw like it's very it's, it's something i've never noticed before and it's a really interesting point yeah. that some of the words from that draw the people would pronounce 
um, do sound like that, that Boston accent and South Boston yeah, accent. So yeah. I'm wondering, would it more to do with the migration came? Because like during the, the famine, like in, in Kerry, um, you had the seaside, you had the rivers, you had different things. Um, it wasn't as as harshly hit. And then a lot of Kerry people like stayed here or they came back after they, they yeah. immigrated. Um, so um, I wonder, was it would it be to do with that maybe? like, Or what do you think? Yeah, quite possibly. I think Dublin up until, I suppose, the early 20th century would have had a similar kind of uh, non-rhotic style accent as well, according to stuff I've read. Um, so, yeah, I'd say it was more like a northeastern um, thing because I suppose you wouldn't have had, a, I suppose, in, in the West, even though the land was poor and the parcels of the land were quite small, um, people would have had their own little bit of land, whereas in the East it was all owned by predominantly English landlords. You would have had that over the West as well, but more so you had these big estates and everything I suppose, that was being produced over here was being shipped back to England bar, bar the potatoes that were failing. So I suppose, yeah, it was huge amounts of relocation from the East and Northeast over there, yeah. Okay, I have another question for you um, from your research. Um, have you ever found much mentions of Irish sticks, of blackthorn, of like, you know, in terms of like weaponry that was used? And what's kind of like earliest type of records that you can like remember from your your uh, your references or anything off the top of your head even? Well, I suppose the closest thing you'd, you'd have to the sticks and that it would be Two things, I suppose, the, the magician staff, which is very kind of pr predominant, you know, and um, there's a fella called Myra or Mogrua, depending on your dialect, um, who hailed from Valencia Island in County Kerry. And this fella was a very powerful magician. He was a druid. Um, a now, when I say he was, he was a mythical figure. And he appears in he's he's kind of a lesser known figure too because a lot of the monster uh, mythology is probably not as well known as they're, they're, they don't have there isn't a full cycle of things like you have with the Cullen cycle and things like that um but this chap he he was it appears in stories that are set in around 2000 bc he appears in stories around the time of christ and he appears in stories around 400 AD at the time of Saint, around the same time as Finn McCool, you know. So he, time travel. Would, that's pretty cool, man. A an Irish yeah, time yeah. travel. Yeah, and one of the so there's a very interesting story about him where he goes to goes off to the Middle East to learn magic from a chap called Simon Magus, who appears in the Bible. He was a, an enemy of um, Saint Peter and a foundational figure in some kind of heretical Christian uh, faiths. And when he's on his way over there, he stops off in, um, in I suppose, what would be modern day Lebanon. And he ends up getting the job of beheading John the Baptist. And we did, we did an episode on this and it's quite, quite a, a strange story, but which probably had historical context in terms of, you know, some heresy that was going on in Ireland at the time. And they wanted to link this druid figure to this heresy. Um, but he was well known for his his magician staff. Um, I don't know if there's anything to say what it was made out of, but you know, the probability would have been it was made out of blackthorn because black blackthorn, you know, is very connected with fairy lore and things like that. You know, um, you're supposed to avoid the blackthorn on Galton and Mayday because the fairies were out playing around it and they don't like you to get too, too close um, and the fairies the, the fairies are interesting because they're they're scary yeah. they're scary <clears throat> factors like yeah. uh they, they they they're really mean like um horrible looking things it's not like it's not like tinkerbell you know or one of these like yeah. uh you know, hot halloween girls you see dressed up in fairy outfits it's more and more monstrous oh yeah yeah you've got you've got the uh, different classes of them as well you've got the puka who actually we've uh, one of our dogs is called puka but um the puka was kind of a, you would be walking somewhere and the man would stop you on the road and he'd 
have your ear, you know, he wouldn't let you go and he'd be talking away to you. And next thing you turn into this half horse, half goat thing and throw you up on his back and go off on this like wild ride until you fell off. But he wouldn't kill you, just like terrify you. Um, so it was said that you, you should always, especially if you were going out on Halloween night, you should wear spurs because it's the only way to get off the, the puka's back. But um, then you would have things like the, the leprechaun, of course, which people would know of but the depiction modern depiction of the leprechaun the leprechaun was actually quite tall and the modern depiction of the leprechaun is is more akin to another figure called the Fardaric, which is the red man um so yeah and interestingly one of my favorite things is a group called the slushi which literally means fairy host but they're often described as the restless dead and they're essentially irish mythical zombies they're people who didn't make it into heaven, or if you go back, they didn't make it into the other world yet. You know, so they're squandering the land, groaning and stuff, and sometimes turn into birds. Irish mythology and folklore is very strange, yeah. Um, but then, I suppose other kind of weapons and implements that are interesting, might be interesting to yourself is, you know, the, the god, um, the Dagda, also known as, which the Dagdam is believed to mean the good god. Um, he's also known as Okadolahar, which is like the, the the supreme horseman father, um, which I suppose points to the importance of uh, horsemanship in the time of no, nomadism. Um, he's also known as Ruroesa, which would mean the red man of perfect knowledge or all knowledge. Um, and Fur Ben, which is the man of the peaks and ridges, he had an implement, and this is one of a very interesting kind of example of how la language and you can interpret in different ways, and people have interpreted things in different ways. So he had a an implement that was sometimes a weapon, sometimes a magician's object, called Angel Gika, which you can translate in a number of ways. You can translate it as being a club. So when it's translated as club, it's a weapon. When it's translated as a staff, it's his magician staff. And when it's his magician staff, it's pointed, it's forked at one end and smooth at the other. And one end, he can kill somebody and the other end, he can bring somebody back to life. And the word, can also be translated as a part of the male body. Um, and people will say, well, you know, it could have been this or could have been this. And I said, well, why not all of them? Because, you know, the, the poets who made these were a very important class of people, very clever people. And like, you know yourself, we, the Irish enjoy a bit of wordplay. So I think that they probably played with the interpretations of these things and you know, that staff was also a club and was also the part of the man's body that connected him to being, you know, a fertility god. And, um, that still exists today, Mark. I get guys to make that references to my sticks very often. And uh, yeah. even I got a, a load of videos taken down, demonetized by uh, YouTube for uh, for making a, a reference to how big the knob <laughs> was on the top of a walking stick. And <clears throat> it seems that... Um, it, if if that kind of culture is here now, it would only make sense that guys would have associated it with, you know, having a big staff with a big uh, handle as, a, a, you know, yeah. saying this is a, a representation of me. It's not like having a big motorbike yeah. and having a small a small thing. It's uh, it seems yeah. to like I can see that from talking to guys within this community as well. Like uh, it, it, there is something very masculine. Um, about it and uh you know it does emphasize you know their their prowess their fertility it, it it can be quite quite a strong symbol that this is the attachment that guys have to it as well but then the other side there's guys that um give their walking six girls names and seems to 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 have that kind of connection <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite interesting yeah <laughs> but um okay and uh so do you have any um do you have any like books in the work or what are you working on anything because you have this this vast array of knowledge you're doing this podcast with your your partner Steph and uh you know I can see all those books behind you like I I know Mark they're not for sure you've actually read them like most <laughs> guys 
most guys with bookcases behind them, they're full of shit. Like they don't, they've never read, they've never read in a life, but I've known you, you've read all of them more than once probably as well. Um, from, from knowing you, but, um, do you have any, any plans or are you in the works of writing something? Because like, you've touched on so many things there that I'd love to deep dive into. Um, even about monster, about the guy in Valencia, about fairies, like there's such a vast array of knowledge that you have that is just not out there. That's why I was very keen to get you on this podcast. And I'd want you back regularly if, if you want, uh, because there's so much that we can kind of dive into today is just kind of give it an overview, but, um, have you ever thought of like, um, or, or have you already done some, some works or, or putting out some different things? Because, you know, what you do is, is better to, to read and absorb and, and to divulge because there's such a, a, a lot of information to, to like, if you're speaking it, it, it can be a lot to take in. You probably have to watch it back a few times, but, uh, with a book you can underline and study. So what I'm kind of getting at is, <laughs> do you have a books in the work, Mark? Um, I, I... Well, what we have with the, I suppose I have, you know, all of the podcast episodes are, you know, there's a lot of research that goes into them and we have a lot of notes and there's a lot of, I would do, or myself or staff, depending on who's done the bulk of the research for the episode, we'll do a, you know, a script that, it'll be a rough script and we'll, we'll veer off and things, but it's just to keep the thing on track, you know, and so I suppose there's, there's probably, you know, a book's worth of stuff in what we have done already. Um, I suppose at some stage it probably would be interested in doing, just putting out kind of a, you know, a book connected to the podcast. But I, I, I suppose my real passion is, is, is the actual storytelling, you know? Um, well, that's not, it's, it's not me because I do have a passion for the, the analysis and the description and, but I think um, because within each episode of the podcast, there, there's a, an adaptation of one of the stories. I really enjoy doing that part. Um, so at some, at some stage, I'd also like to kind of branch out into fiction. I have some bits and pieces of I, I basically, you know, you know me and you probably remember from back in college, I'd start something and then I'd start something else because something else had so I yeah, I remember like, you had some wild books and you were yeah. into Pinchon and that uh, chapter about the ear infection. I remember you were telling me oh, in yeah. great detail. I forgot about that one. Yeah. I remember, yeah, I remember the book you were doing as well with the uh, the, the vampires and and uh, Martyr's Vineyard and the Hitler thing as well. And uh, you have you have some wild ideas. Well, Mark, you know, I haven't completely heard. abandoned that one. It's kind of the ideas oh, really? kind of changed a bit, but um, <laughs> but, 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 I, but I do That's have a story. I do have. Um, so there was one thing I'd started as writing a short story and then I made it into a chapter of a novel and then I wrote like four or five chapters, but they, they weren't, you know, sequential. And then I started doing the podcast and that, that, that was kind of influenced by Irish mythology, that, that stuff. Um, and, but then last summer I was just, sitting around and I just started writing something else and I have a few chapters in sequence of another novel that's actually based on Norse, Norse mythology but set in it, it, it's like the story of Odin and his sons if they were a few lads that lived on the street in Navan or Drada, do you know it's kind of warped into a, the story of a family and all their misadventures Um. So that's kind of something I'm interested in going on. But as I was saying, like the, the podcast, when like it's 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 a full time, it's nearly on top of my full time job. When when I'm doing it regularly, it's a full time thing because you know between research and writing and adaptation and and then editing the thing because when we do the story part, the sound effects to do and all stuff like that, you know, it can take you. 30 hours of work if you put all that together you know yeah but it's two people what what i really like about your your podcast 
is the amount of research that you put into it. You're not just churning them out. You're taking your time. You're researching it. Like when when someone listens to the Irish mythology uh, po- uh, bo- uh, podcast, um, they're going to have to listen to it twice. There's just so much valuable information. And what I really like is the balance between you and uh, a Steph. Is it Steph or Steffi? I've seen it. I'm not sure. Steffi, yeah. Not- yeah. Steffi. Yeah. So because Steffi is completely kind of different personality to you. There's like a, a perfect balance between you back and forth as well. And uh, she's just got a nice voice as well to listen to on a podcast yeah, just, yeah, yeah. over your nav and drone. Like, but um, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it works very well and uh, it's so informative. And, you know, if you're at work or something, you can have it running in the background. You can listen to it a few times. I think you put out like one or two a month. And I think that's the right pace for the amount of research that you put into it. And because you do have a full time job, but it's yeah. not just you putting into work. It's also Steph. So there's, the, there's yeah. like an insurmountable number of hours like you're not going to get a podcast like this with this amount of research put into it from two people that are as knowledgeable as as, as both of you so i can't recommend it enough it's uh it's really good um you know the sound effects the story um i every time i listen to it i learn almost a hundred percent because I, I didn't know anything like i i yeah. thought i knew things and then i listened to the irish mythology podcast and i'm like really oh i didn't know that and uh, i think that you know, you, you do it in a very kind of fun and entertaining way. It's very engaging as well. And, uh, you know, it, it, there's nothing there's nothing like it out there, Mark, that, uh, you know, I, I'm happy always to, to, like, support it, to promote it. I think it's something that, uh, you know, mo- ma- many people need to, to listen to. I number a lot of people listen to me waffle and talk away as they work. I think it'd be more beneficial to them to listen to your <laughs> podcast <laughs> over, over me as well. <laughs> But um, and I'd like to to definitely get Steph on as well to get uh, get her perspective and do an interview so you can right. you can ask if, if she wants to. And um, I just want to ask as well, like, um, wh- why not do a YouTube or something like that? Um, you know, have you ever considered doing something like that? Well, what I have considered doing, I suppose, is um, putting what I kind of had started doing is just again a time thing is. I suppose converting some of them and putting them onto YouTube with kind of slideshows and things, or maybe just recording. Um, but I suppose I do, well, I do have some kind of video experience. I'm, you know, I did my postgrad stuff in broadcast journalism, so I, I kind of even though when I was coming back into it, it was a whole different experience because when you were editing back then you had you had mini disc or you had tape and when you were editing tape you were literally cutting the tape and then yeah, everything it together <laughs> whereas now it's it's all software and um, so it was a bit different but same principles apply you know and i'm quite adept to now you know almost not you know i still listen I, obviously you have to listen but i, I can spot things on the sound wave you know and the thing that i know that are things i'm going to be cutting out in advance um so it's, it's something that gives me a bit of pleasure it's kind of a almost meditative thing to edit the sound even though some, sometimes by the time i finished it i might have listened to the whole thing about 20 times and it's i want to destroy it but you know it's i think it's just something that appeals to me editing things in general you know Okay, um, and where's where's the best place? So, if people want to connect with you, Mark, is it the Irish uh, Mythology Podcast Facebook page? Is that the best way, or what's the best way to get in touch? It depends on what your what your preferred um, social Format media is. is. So, you can just the Facebook page. We have the Twitter, which I'm kind of more of a Twitter person. Um, now doesn't surprise me, Mark. <laughs> uh, yeah, Steph, Steffi does the does the Instagram. I do the Twitter and the Facebook. Um, and you can find us on Spotify and you can find us on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. The list is endless because basically you, you you have a, a platform and you upload it and they distribute it to all the Audible as well. We're on the Audible and Apple, um, Audible and Amazon Music. You can so they just search. So in any of those platforms, they just type in Irish Mythology Podcast That's and it. they'll find it. That's it, yeah. And you can't miss us. It's a big our logo is a big thing. It says Irish Mythology Podcast. Um yeah, and there's we've got twenty-five episodes up there so far and we had a bit of a 
break after Christmas, just got back and we released one yesterday. Um, what was yesterday's episode about? Sure, we'll just finish up. Just give us a little introduction yeah. on that episode so people, you know, can uh, can can check that out. Yesterday's was a bit of a different one. We didn't have a story, and we normally do um, around this time of year. We'll do something to do with St. Patrick, but this year we did one on a phenomenon known as Sheila's Day, which is kind of not that well known, but in some areas this was celebrated. And I don't know whether this actually originated in Ireland or originated in the Irish diaspora and was brought back because the, most of the um, document documented evidence, there's some documented evidence of what happened in Ireland, but most of the documented evidence occurs in Newfoundland. Um, I think maybe Philadelphia and Sydney and Melbourne in Australia. And it, it, Sheila's Day is the day is March the 18th, the day after St. Patrick's Day. And in some of the folklore, she's St. Patrick's wife. Now, the, our, you know, analysis of it was that there's no real evidence that this was the case. I mean, St. Patrick could have had a wife because the clergy were allowed to marry back then. It was no mention of it anywhere, you know, until the 19th century. So it's stuff yeah. like that that I'm always, you know, really fascinated by where these things come from, you know, and we do a lot of chat about that. So that's what yesterday's episode was about. It's only short, it's only 20 minutes, that one. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. And so that sounds pretty really good. Yeah. All right. So we'll, we'll wind it up for today, Mark. It's been a pleasure connecting you again. Uh, you are a wealth wealth of knowledge. Um, I'm going to listen back to this, and there's several things that you mentioned and touched on today. I'd love to to get you back on. Um, I'd love to get Steph on. I'd love to get both of you on as well. And uh, you know, you're 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 a great guy to listen to. Um, your podcast, the sound is is impeccable. Your your voice and Steph's voice are like so so um uh, work together like a yin and yang type of thing. So uh, okay. I can't, can't compliment enough. So anyway, Mark, thank you very much for for uh, coming on my channel yeah. and uh, check out the Irish Mythology podcast. Okay, goodbye. Yeah.